she hasn't decided not to come tonight. Is uh, Ian McKellen not joining us tonight either? Ian McKellen would love yes. to be here, I'm sure. Yeah. He would no, travel no. all the way to Hawaii just to yeah. appear yeah. on Shakespeare. Yeah. Well, he heard, he heard of you and he wanted to, you know. Yes, I'm sure he did. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to cuss me out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. As long as he brought along Judy Dench, I don't care. Yeah. Do whatever he wants. Name Judy. Ms. Dame Judy. And her famous uh, tea with the dames. Yeah. Did you get a chance to look at any of the videos? Not yet. I uh, talked to my cousin in England and she said, Peter, have you finished doing your memoir yet? Because we <laughs> want to read it. So I spent part of my day today, instead of watching any videos, writing. Oh my. So. Uh, my friend has. She's fast, she's, my cousin in England is fascinated that I was only seven miles from Pearl Harbor when it was being bombed. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> and you were only, what, three yeah. or four years old? Yeah. You were four years, I was four years hey. old. Yeah. So you. What was your story on it? What was that? What was your story on Pearl? Oh, I was, I had asthma and I was in Children's Hospital on Kuakini Street. Oh, wow. And they, uh, I remember being scared because they shut down all the windows at night, all the blacked it out, everything. Yes. And I didn't know why. I didn't find out until later on that it was because Pearl Harbor was being bombed. Yes. <laughs> and also that happened like for two or three years, didn't it? Like, uh, well, no. The bombing didn't go on for two or three years. No, I understand that. Yeah. But it was blackout. And, oh, and yeah, that probably did. But my mom, I, it's a long story, but I'll, it's, my mom had remarried to an army officer, so we had to move to North Carolina. I see. Wow. So by January, a month later, I was in North Carolina. Wow. What a treat. <laughs> yep, yep. Seeing my new baby brother. <laughs> the um, the pictures that I've seen in that era was the barbed wire in um, on the Waikiki Beach, uh, the spools of barbed wire, yeah, over yep. and over, over yep. Yep. all the way to Diamond Head. Uh -huh. Very scary. Very scary. Yeah, it was. But I'm glad to say it was nowhere near. Yeah. I, and Ohio on my mind. Yes. <laughs> and oddly enough, <laughs> Ohio, speaking yes. of Japanese, is greetings in Japanese. Yes. yes. Ohio gozaimasu. Yes, yes. But when I was going to school, I didn't know that. And I heard Ohio gozaimasu. And I thought that was Japanese for must I go to Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> Must I go? <laughs> That's pretty good. That's the worst place I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Ohio. Well, if I have to be from someplace, I'm glad I was from there. Yeah. It was in a little college town that, um, all my learning could be found in that library at the, on the university campus. Oh. And uh, I know I spent most of my teenage years in there. Then I got a job at age 16, music store. Yeah. Everything else changed. Yeah. Have you ever yeah. heard of a town called Chagrin Falls, Ohio? I have, but I can't think how I've heard of it. Uh, uh, interesting. Well, uh, my friend John moved there um, oh. when we were in high school. <laughs> so, uh, but I doubt if you heard of it that way. No. But uh, yeah, I've seen it, you know, in the news a few times for some reason. Um, oh, I think it was in the news recently because 
the residents were boarding up the town because they thought Antifa was going to come and break all their windows or something like that. You know, wow. go to small, you know, uh, town. <laughs> so everybody got scared because they heard this rumor that Antifa was going to come to town and break all their windows. Antifa, you know. huh? Oh, uh, Antifa. That's, I think, I think it's up by Cleveland. Or Toledo. Uh, yeah, it's south of Cleveland, away, yeah, out in the country. I lived in uh, Steubenville for nine years, uh, but uh, I'm from the west side of Ohio. Do you ever have the feeling you'd like to go back and see what it looks like now? I was back in 2002. Oh. And uh, that was enough, thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. My father uh, uh, was close to death and I wanted to take pictures of different uh, buildings in, in Oxford because, you know, he was the plumber. Right. And, uh, you know, I took these pictures of his place where he used to live and he said, look at that, it's got three apartments in it. I said, how'd you know that? And he said, well, because of all the gas uh, meters that were outside the house. <laughs> uh -huh. I would never have thought of that. No. But uh, they probably have cleaned up Ohio quite a bit since you were there. I mean, it used to be this industrial heartland, right, with all kinds of factories polluting the air and the water. But since all the factories moved to China now, uh, the Cuyahoga River no longer catches fire. Yes. Um, so, Two yeah, things that's about, uh, about the health hazards and stuff. Um, I lived in Steubenville, Ohio, which is over by Pittsburgh. And that was the, that was the area where your lungs actually turned gray if you stayed there very long. And, you know, nine years is super long. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the doctor said, um, uh, you need to do some, uh, some things to change that. And of course I did, I just moved out, got out of there. <laughs> but, um, what can you do to change it? Yeah, I guess yeah. wear a gas mask. Or... Yeah. And then there was the Miami River, which ran down to Cincinnati. And my cousin's daughter uh, was three years old and she got cancer from that river and uh, so they used her as a poster child and uh, publicity of getting well and she's now like 21 years old and uh, doing oh, great she was cured. oh yeah she got through all that that's why they made her a poster girl I think how did they know she got cancer from that river? Well, they finally broke it down to the fact that the river was polluted. And uh, so everybody that lived there, uh, I guess, either moved out or they finally cleaned up the, the river. I don't know what the story was, but uh, it was just enough time uh, that when they moved there, it was like three years before my uh, little cousin got sick. So I don't know. It was a crazy, crazy time. I'm sure they wanted to check out. Well, we got 704 on my watch. And Leilani is due back, but uh, we don't need to have her right away. All right, if everybody would look at their script and see the 10,000 people who are in the cast. Well, I tried to break it down to 10 people and then broke it down to eight and then down to six, but still it doesn't work. Anyway, uh, so it's gonna be a free for all as far as uh, reading a role or whatever. Um, and I've tried to give people as many uh, roles as I can without, uh, without talking to yourself. One thing I wanted to change, Mike, is your 
first one, Duke of York, I don't think, I may be wrong, but it's not on the cast list. I checked two or three times this afternoon and I don't know where I got that name. So if you would please take Suffolk, S-O-F-F-O-L-K. And the rest of them stay there. I might mention to everybody that Lord Chancellor is listed in the in the script. And that's our old friend from two weeks ago, who is Sir Thomas More. And uh, so that'll be your double reading. Uh, I'm going recurring to- Recurring role, as they say. A recurring, yes. Thank God this you won't be in the next one. So- um, Thank God he got drawn and quartered. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard a little bit about that stuff. I don't think he did. I think he's just got hung, but uh, I may be wrong. He certainly didn't get his head on a spike. Uh, he was already sainted um, when he passed away. So Daniel will not be here tonight. Uh, I, I guess I can tackle uh, Woolsey. Because I don't have uh, I don't have big lines on the others, but uh, Woolsey is second second in command next to Peter as far as the lines go. You got a brand new situation in your house there, Keith. What's going on? Several different pieces of crap is what it is. <laughs> well, I see a couple of paintings too, and a trumpet. My God. <laughs> painting, uh, I did. I did. I have some paintings of mine. <laughs> so, can you play a fanfare for us at the beginning here? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm in a sort of household. I see. I that think... would be a perfect time to play it. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, uh, no, I, it, it's real. You know, I, I played trumpet before. You know, actually, well, trumpet. Yeah. I don't well, you can do the flourishes and the uh, stuff. Well, that's it. Yeah. Ah. We want a fanfare. I have, to, I have to practice and actually have a trumpet. <laughs> that's just a bugle. <laughs> we'll, we'll bugle be... works. <laughs> Perfect. I <laughs> better what I would do. <laughs> You got the ukulele. Yeah. Um, we should get kazoos so we can all chime yeah. in and do the same. Yeah, thing. yeah, kazoos. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to cut the uh, prologue. It doesn't say anything except that you might cry instead of laugh at this uh, play that's being done. I saw a video of it done on the Globe stage and King, the King was sitting in a big throne chair and uh, there was a little small puppet, little boy puppet. And of course that was his dream the whole time was to get an heir for his for his kingdom, and uh, the woman who was working the puppet uh, did the prologue. But I, it doesn't go anywhere, so let's cut it. And the same way with Act One, Scene One, the Duke of Norfolk and the Duke of Buckingham, uh, they're all uh, talking about what's happening and uh, that being uh, wants to divorce his wife and marry Anne Boleyn and uh, hopefully have an heir. But his wife cannot uh, bear any children before uh, again. So um, that's up. Anyway, uh, so let's start with scene two in act one. 
already yeah. got that space. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh. Scene two, act one? Yes. Um, it's the uh, council chamber and the chair of state and uh, enter King Henry with uh, leaning on the cardinal's shoulders and the nobles and Sir Thomas Lovell. The cardinal places him, himself under the king's feet on his right side. That's and there's, there's Cornet. Yes, what I'm saying, that's the very first top of the show. <laughs> Who wants to turn all that out? Oh, hey, Cornet. There you go. <laughs> Blowing right into the microphone, for God's sake. <laughs> you, that's like the softest I can. That sounded good to me. <laughs> beginning. Okay, Peter. Jump in here. Okay, I may have to change my furniture because the light isn't that good here, but I'll give my best for right now. Okay. My life itself. I'm the best heart of it. Thanks you, thanks you for the great care. I have stood or the, um, in the loved of full charge confederacy and give thanks to you that choked it. Let be called before us the gentlemen of Buckingham in person that have him uh, to hear his confessions justify and point by point the reasons of his master shall he, uh, he shall again relate. Room for the queen! Room for the queen! Room for the queen! And since Leilani has returned, Una, could you read uh, till, till Leilani gets back? Sure. Nay, we must longer kneel. I'm a suitor. Arise and take place by us. Half your suit uh, never named to us. You have half our, half our power. The other uh, moitry, ere you ask, is given. Repeat your will and take it. Thank you, your majesty, that you would love yourself in that love, not unconsidered. Leave your honor nor the dignity of your office is the point of my petition. Lady mine, proceed. I am solicited, not by a few, and those of true condition, that your subjects are in great grievance. There have been commissions sent down along, among them which have flewed the heart of all that loyalties, wherein, although my good Lord Cardinal, they vent reproaches most bitterly on you as putters on all of these exactions. Yet the king, our master, whose honor heaven shield from soil, even he escapes not. Language unmannerly, yet such which breaks the side of loyalty and almost appears in a loud rebellion. Not almost appears. It doth appear, for upon these taxations, these clothiers all, not able to maintain the many to them longing, have put off the spinsters, carters, fullers, weavers, who, unfit for other life, compelled by hunger and lack of other means, in desperate manner daring the event to the teeth, are all in uproar and Danger serves among them. Uh, taxation? Wherein? And what taxation? My Lord Cardinal, you that are blamed for it are like uh, with us. Know you of this chant taxation? Please you, sir, uh, I know but a single part of a naught, and pertains to the state, and front but in that file where others tell steps with me. No, my lord, you know no more than others, but you you frame things that are known alike, which are not wholesome to those which would not know them, and yet must 
perforce be their acquaintance these exceptions whereof my sovereign would have known they are most pestilent to the hearing and to bear them the back of sacrifice to the lord they say they are devised by you and else suffered too hard an exclamation still exaction the nature of it and what kind let us know is this exaction i'm much too venturous in tempting of your patience but am boldened under your permit um promised pardon the subject's grief comes through commissions which compels from each the sixth part of his substance to be levied oh she's back hi <laughs> goodbye what's that <laughs> <laughs> oh, Leilani is here, but she's still looking for the place where I we are. I found it. I found it. Okay, good, good. Well, to be levied without delay, and the pretense for this, it's named. Your wars in France, this makes bold mouths. Tongues spit their duties out, and cold hearts freeze allegiance in them. Their curses now live where their prayers did, and it's come to pass the tractable obedience is a slave to each incensed will. I would your highness would give it quick consideration, for there is no primer business. By my life, what, what, this is against our pleasure. And for me, I have no further gone in this uh, than by a single voice, and that not past me, but by learned approbation of the judges. If I am traduced by ignorant tongues, uh, then neither know my faculties or nor person, yet will be the chronicle of my doing. And let me say, it is but the fair fate of place and the rough uh, break that virtue must go through. We must not stint on the, uh, our necessary actions in the fear to cope in malicious sanctions, and whichever as ravenous fishes do a vessel follow. That is new trimmed, but benefit for further, no further than vainly longing. What we oft have best uh, by sick interpreters, uh, want weak ones in our, in not ours and not allowed, uh, and what worse as oft hitting a grosser quality is cried up in our best act. If we shall stand still, in further our motion will be mocked or carped at, or we shall take root here where we at, where we sit and sit in state statues only. Things done well and with uh, care exempt themselves from fear. Things done without example in their issue are to be feared. Have you a president <laughs> of this commission? I believe not any. We must not rend our subjects from their laws and stick them in our will. Sixth part of each a trembling contribution. Why, we take from every tree, block, bark, and part of the timber. And though we leave it not with the root, thus hacked, the air will drink the sap. To every country where this is questioned, spend our letters with free pardon to each man that hath denied the force of this commission. Pray, look to it. I put it to your care. Have you a flashlight, Peter, somewhere nearby? Actually, I do, but you know what? I'm just thinking, it's, I should have put this on the desk behind me. The light is better there. Oh, I see. So when we I'm going to get you I'll one of these. <laughs> it's a magnifying glass with a light on it. That's oh, I've got. I've got a magnifying, the magnifying glass. magnifying glass with a light. <laughs> yes, I didn't it's know that. It's wonderful. Had, I didn't know I they existed. That. Uh, about a month ago, and I don't like it as much as just a regular old flashlight. Anyway. Yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> uh, we a word with you. Whenever Mr. we can take a break, I'll move up to my desk, and it's better there. 
a word with you. Let there be letters writ to every shire of the king's grace and pardon. The grieved dead uh, Collins hardly conceive of me. Let it be noised that through our intercession this revokement and pardon comes. I shall anon advise you further in the proceedings. I am sorry that the Duke of Buckingham is ruined in your displeasure. It grieves many. The gentleman is learned and uh, a most rare speaker. Uh, Nature none more bound does his training such that he may furnish and instruct guest teachers and never seek to for aid out of himself. Yet, see, when one of these noble benefits shall prove not well disposed, the mind growing once corrupt, uh, they turn to vicious forms, ten times more ugly than ever they were fair. This man so complete, who was enrolled amongst the uh, wonders, and when we, almost with ravished listening, could not find his hour of speech a minute, he, uh, my lady, hath into monstrous habits put the graces that once were his, and is become as black as if besmeared in hell. Sit by us, you shall hear, this was his gentleman in trust, of him, things to strike honor sad. Bid him recount the four recited practices, whereof we cannot feel too little, nor hear too much. Stand forth, and with old spirit, uh, relate what you, most like a careful subject, have collected out of the Duke of Buckingham. Speak freely. First, it was usual with him every day, it would infect his speech that if the king should without issue die, he'll carry it so to make the scepter his. These very words I've heard him utter to his son-in-law, Lord Abergavani, to whom by oath he menaced revenge upon the cardinal. Please, your highness, note his dangerous conception in this point, not trended by his wish and to your high person, his will is most malignant, and it stretches beyond your friends. My learned Lord Cardinal, deliver all with charity. Speak on. How grounded he is titled to the crown upon our fail. To this point hast thou heard him at any time speak aught? He was brought to this by vain prophecy of Nicholas Hopkins. What was that? Oh, no, Henton. I've got Henton in my... Henton. What was that Henton? Hopkins. A Sir Chereau friar, his confessor, who fed him every minute with words of sovereignty. How knowest thou this? Not long before your highness sped to France, the duke being at the Rose, Within the parish, St. Lawrence Pulteney did of me demand what was the speech among the Londoners concerning the French journey. I replied, men feared the French would prove perfidious to the king's danger. Presently, the duke said, "'Twas the fear indeed that he doubted "'twould prove the verity of certain words "'spoke by a holy monk that off he, says he, hath sent to me, wishing me to permit Jean de la Car, my chaplain, a choice hour to hear from him a matter of some moment, whom, after under the confession's seal, he solemnly had sworn that what he spoke, my chaplain, to no creature living, but to me, should utter with demure confidence, this pausingly ensued. Neither the kings nor heirs tell you the duke shall prosper. Bid him strive to gain the love of the commonality. The duke shall govern England. If I know you well, you were the duke's surveyor and lost your office on the complaint of the tenants. Take good heed you charge not in your spleen a noble person and spoil your nobler soul. I say, take heed 
Yes, heartily beseech you. Let him on. Go forward. On my soul, I speak but truth. I told my lord, the duke, by the devil's illusions, the monk might be deceived, and that t'was dangerous for him to ruminate on this so far, until it forged him some design, which being believed, it was much like to do. He answered, Tush, it can do me no damage. Adding further that the king ha in his last sickness failed the cardinals and Sir Thomas Lovell's heads should have gone off. Huh? What? What? What's so rank? Aha! No, no, the mischief in this man. Canst thou say further? I can, my liege. Proceed. Being at Greenwich, after your highness had reproved the duke about Sir William Blomer. Uh, I, I remember of such a time, being of my sworn servant. The duke retained him his. But on, what, what hence? If, quote he, I for this had been committed, as to the tower, I thought, I would have played the part of my father meant to act upon the usurper Richard, who, being at Salisbury, made suit to come in his presence, if granted, as he made semblance of his duty, would have put his knife to him. A giant tr traitor. Now, madam, may his highness live in freedom, and this man out of prison? God mend all. There's something more that would out of thee. The, what sayest? After the duke his father with the knife, he stretched him, and with one hand on his dagger, another spread on his breast. Mounting his eyes, he did discharge a horrible oath, whose tenor was, were he evil used, he would outgo his father by as much as a performance does in irresolute purpose. The, there's his period to sheath his knife in us. He is attached. Call him to present trial. If he may find mercy in the law, tis his. If none, let him not seek it of us. By day and night, he's traitor to the height. There they go. Antechamber in the palace. I love that rhythm there. Lord Chamberlain, um, would you read that? And Lord Sam is Mike. I don't know who I am. Here we go. Tis possible the spells of France should juggle men into such strange mysteries. New customs, though they be never so ridiculous, nay, let them be unmanly, yet are followed. As far as I see, all the good our English have got by the late voyage is but merely a fit or two of the face. But they are shrewd ones. For when they hold them, you would swear directly their very noses had been counselors to Pippin and Chlorathius. They kept state so. They have all new legs and lame ones. One would take it that never saw them peep before. The spaven and the spring halt reigned among them. Death, my lord, their clothes are after. Such a pagan cut, too. That's sure. They've worn out Christendom. How now? What's new, Sir Thomas Lovell? Oh, faith, my lord, I hear of none but the new proclamation that's clapped upon the court gate. What's for? Well, the reform of our traveled gallant that filled the court with quarrels, talk, and tailors. I'm glad it is there. Now I would pray our monsieurs to think an English courtier may be wise and never see the Louvre. <laughs> they must either or for so run the conditions, leave those remnants a fool and feather that they got in France, and with all the honorable points of ignorance, 
pertaining thereunto as fights and fireworks, abusing better men than they can be, out of a foreign wisdom, renouncing clinging the, the faith that they have in tennis, and tall stockings, <laughs> shirt, blistered breeches, and those types of travel, and understand again the honest men, or pack to their old playfellows, there I take it, they may come privilegio. Oh, we away and lag end of their lewdness, and be laughed at. <laughs> It is time to give them physic. Their diseases are grown so catching. What's a loss our ladies will have of these trim vanities? Aye, Mary, there will be woe indeed. And lords, the uh, sly horses may have had a speeding trick to lay down ladies. <laughs> and a French song and a fiddle has no fellow. The devil fiddle them. I'm glad they're going. For sure, there's no converting of them. Now, an honest country lord as I am, beaten a long time out of play, may bring his plain song and have an hour of hearing, and by her lady held current music too. Well said, Lord Sands. Your colt's tooth is not cast yet. No, my lord, nor shall not, while I have a stump. Uh -huh. Sir Thomas, whither you are going? And to the cardinals, your lordship is a great guest too. Oh, tis true. This night he makes a supper, and a great one. To many lords and ladies, there will be the beauty of this kingdom, I'll assure you. That... Churchman that bears a bounteous mind indeed, a hand as fruitful as the land that feeds us. His dues fall everywhere. No doubt he's noble. He had a black mouth that said other of him. He may, my lord, has wherewithal in him sparing would show a worse sin than ill doctrine. Men of his way should be most liberal. They are set here for example. True, they are so. But few now give so great ones. My barge stays, your lordship shall along. Come, good Sir Thomas. We shall be late else, which I would not be, for I was spoke to with Sir Henry Guildford this night to be comptrollers. I am your lordships. Off they go to a hall in York Place. And there's old boys. Scene <laughs> four. Uh, Rudy entered. Ruby. Ruby? Oh. Yeah, not Rudy. That'd be. <laughs> oh, Ruby could read, sir, read Anne. Um, Ruby, we're on scene four. Okay. Act one, scene four. You came at the right time. All right. I'm on it. Do you have an oboe? <laughs> yeah, I, I have two of them. Really? Uh, oh, well, uh, what bust, you got? bust them out because they have the hot boys are playing, right? <laughs> hot boys. Mike is reading in profile tonight. <laughs> I mean, I know not your meaning. What are the hot boys? Oh, hot They're boys are oboes. The it's musical a... instrument, oboe. Oh, I thought you said oh. elbows. No, not <laughs> elbows. We have elbows. Oh. Yes, I have two of them. <laughs> oh, I have two elbows. I'm going to be playing when stereo. Uh, oh, I'm going to have to work on my enunciation. Or my hearing, yeah. <laughs> All right, oboes and a small table under the under the state for the cardinal. Longer table for the guests. Then enter Anne Boleyn. Thank goodness she's here, and diverse other ladies and gentlemen as guests. At one 
one door at another door, uh, Sir Henry Guilford. And that's one I'm reading. Okay. Ah, Guilford. Okay, dokie. Uh, ladies, a general welcome from His Grace. I salute ye all. And this night is uh, dedicated to fair content and you. None here, he hopes, in all this uh, noble baby he has brought with her no care abroad, one care abroad, and he would love all as merry as first, good company, good wine, good welcome that can uh, make good people. Oh, my Lord, your tardy, and the very thought of this fair company claps wings to see to me. You are young, Sir Harry Guildford. Sir Thomas Lovell had the cardinal, but half my lay thoughts in him. Some of these should find a running banquet ere they rested. I think would better please them. <laughs> By my life, they are sweet society of fair ones. And that your love, lordship were but now confessor to one or two of these. I would I were. <laughs> they should find easy penance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, faith, how easy. <laughs> as easy as a down bed would afford it. Ah. Sweet ladies, sweet ladies. Will it please you sit? Sir Harry, place you that side. I'll take the charge of this. His grace is entering. Nay, you must not freeze. Two women placed together makes cold weather. My Lord Sands, you are one who will keep waking. Pray, sit by these ladies. By my faith, and thank your lordship for your leave, sweet ladies. If I chance to talk a little wild, forgive me, I had it from my father. <laughs> Was he mad, sir? Oh, very mad, exceeding mad, in love too. But he would bite none, just as I do now. He would kiss you twenty with a breath. <laughs> well said, my lord. So, now you're fairly seated. Gentlemen, the penance lies on you. If these fair ladies pass away frowning. For my little cure, let me alone. <laughs> Your elbows. Oh, you're welcome, my fair guests. Uh, that noble lady or gentleman that is fairly, freely merry is not my friend. <laughs> and this to confirm my welcome, and so to you all, all good health. Your grace is noble. Let me have such a bowl. May I hold my thanks and save me so much talking. My Lord Sands, I am beholding to you and clear your neighbors. Uh, ladies, you're not merry. Gentlemen, uh, whose fault is this? The red wine first must rise in their fair cheeks, my lord. Then we shall have them talk us to silence. You're a merry gamester, my Lord Sands. Yes. If I make my play, here's to your lordship and pledge it, madam, for tis to such a thing. You cannot show me. I told your grace they would talk alone. <laughs> rum, rum, rum. <laughs> what is that I hear? Look out there, some of ye. Ah, what? Warlike voice, and to what end is this? Nay, ladies, fear not, for by all the laws of war, you're privileged. And How now? What is it? A noble troop of strangers, for so they seem. They've left their barge and landed, and hither make as great ambassadors from foreign princes. 
Good Lord Chamberlain, go give him welcome. You can speak the French tongue and pray receive him nobly and conduct him into our presence. For when, where this heaven is of beauty shall mine at full upon them, and some attend him. Arise, arise, and you have now a broken banquet and we'll mend it <laughs> a good digestion to you all and once more i shower a welcome on ye welcome all more oboes more king and ye right a noble company ah uh, what are their pleasures because they speak no english thus they prayed to tell your grace that Having heard by fame of this so noble and so fair assembly this night to meet here, they could not do no less. Out of the great respect they bear to beauty, but leave their flocks and, under your fair conduct, crave leave to view these ladies and entreat an hour of revels with them. Well, say, Lord Chamberlain, they have done my poor house grace, for which I pay them a thousand thanks, and pray them take their pleasures. <laughs> yep. The very uh, hand I ever touched. Oh, beauty, uh, till now I never knew thee. My lord. Your grace. I pray tell them these the, thus much from me. Uh, there should be one amongst them uh, by his person more worthy this place than uh, myself, to whom, if I knew them uh, with, their, with my love and duty, I would surrender it. I will, my lord. What have worked for you? Uh, what say they? whispering such a one they all confess there is indeed which they would have your grace find out and he will take it well let me see then uh, by all your good leaves uh, gentlemen here i'll make my royal choice ah you have found him cardinal you hold a fair assembly you do well lord you are a churchman or I'll tell you, Cardinal, I should judge now unhappily. Ah, I am glad your grace is grown as pleasant. <laughs> My Lord Chamberlain, prithee come hither. What fair lady is that? And please, your grace, Sir Thomas Bullen's daughter, the Viscount Rochefort, one of her highest women. By heaven, she is a dainty woman. Sweetheart, I were unmannerly to take you out and uh, not to kiss you. A health, gentlemen, let it go round. And Sir Thomas Lovell, in the banquet ready in the privy chamber. <laughs> oh, yes, my lord. And so, your grace, I fear with dancing is a little heated. I fear too much. Oh, there's treasure, sir, treasure air, and my lord in the second, next chamber. Well, lead in your ladies, every one. Sweet partner, I must not yet forsake you. Let's be merry. Good, my lord cardinal, I have half a dozen uh, healths to drink to these fair ladies, and a measure to lead them once again. And then let's dream where it's best to in favor. Uh, let the music knock it. Knock it. I'm gonna remember that. I like that. I'm gonna have to use that again. Yeah. Hey, let's go dancing. Let the music knock it. Okay, good. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. All right. Let's skip these two little old gentlemen because they're just telling what has happened and it doesn't mean anything. So that goes down to. Uh, Enter Buckingham. Go to scene two. It's uh, act two, scene two. Scene two, yes. It's okay. Scene two. Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, what is it?
It's on the lines there. Yes. Two one two one. Oh, uh, scene two is Chamberlain. Uh, yes, it is. Reading this letter.